Church, I just want to give you an opportunity just to go before him and give him praise. Think about one thing that the Lord has done for you in the year 2024 and just lift your hands and worship him. Tell him, thank you, Lord, that I'm alive today, even when many have gone. But Lord, you have sustained my life. You have helped me. Even when I fell into the ditch, you raised me up, oh God. When I fell sick in the year 2024, you came through for me and healed me, oh God. Thank you because of your faithfulness in my life. Thank you for sustaining my salvation in the year 2024. I praise you, Lord, and I honor you because of your goodness. We give you praise, Lord. We give you honor and we give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, I want us to turn our Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 26. It's a scripture that uh, Gio has taught us from. And I want to attempt to say a few things concerning thanksgiving. Deuteronomy 25, verse 26, verse 1 to verse 15. It's going to be a long read. Uh, but I believe you're going to be blessed. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance and have taken possession of it and live in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from your land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket, and you shall go to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell, to dwell there. And you shall go to the priest who is in the office that time and say to him, I declare today to the Lord, your God, that I have come into the land that the Lord saw to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord, your God. And you shall make a response before the Lord, your God, a wandering Aramean was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there. Few in number, and there he became a nation great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us and laid on us hard labor. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction our toil and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm with great deeds of terror, with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And behold, now I, I bring the first of the fruit of the ground, which you, O Lord, have given me. And you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. And you shall rejoice in all the good that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house, you and the Levite and the sojourner which is among you. When you have finished paying all the tithe of your produce in the third year, which is the year of tithing, give it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow, so that they may eat within your towns and be filled. Then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the sacred portion out of my house, and moreover I have given it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow, according to all your commandment that you have commanded me. I have not transgressed any of your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. I have not eaten of the tithe while I was mourning, or removed any of it while I was unclean, or offered any of it to the dead. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord my God. I have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation, from heaven, and bless your people Israel, and the ground that you have given us, as you saw to our fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. Amen. Father, we thank you for this living word. As we hear it again, I pray that you shall bless our hearts. 
I pray that, Lord, you may use me as a vessel to dispense that which you have for your people. Bless us and be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Today we are thanking God for the many things that he has done to us. It's a season of thanksgiving. And, you know, when I look back from January to this time, there have been so many hurdles, especially for me. But the Lord has taken me through them all. Today I stand as a testimony that the Lord is good. And that the Lord blesses. And what he blesses, no man can curse. Amen? Do you have a testimony like that one? Amen. We are here to give him praise and to give him glory. Thanksgiving, when we talk about Thanksgiving, what exactly is Thanksgiving? I, I have not come with a dictionary meaning of Thanksgiving, but I have come with an understanding that Thanksgiving is when someone acknowledges that as much as they have a job, money, wealth, family, salvation, it is not their own. It's like telling the Lord, yes, I can look around and see my people, I can look around and see my position, but it all belongs to you. And therefore, you humble yourself and you let God be lifted in your life, even in your own achievements. The Lord has done so much for us. Amen. Thanksgiving is saying, yes, I own these things, but the Lord owns me. Amen. Did you hear that one? I thought it was beautiful. I own this job. I own this family, but the Lord owns me. So who is greater in this thing? It is the Lord. Amen. Because he owns the person who has the job, who has the family, who has whatever it is that we have. One acknowledges that what they have, God has enabled them to get it. And so we come back with a heart of thanksgiving, with an attitude of thanksgiving. And we are saying that I can do nothing without the Lord. Amen. So... Um, we have read a beautiful story, Moses reminding the people of Israel what they are supposed to do as they come to the land that God had promised them. And you know, Jew, Jew, Jewish people were full of uh, festivals, thanksgiving. They were the best example of givers. They gave for everything. And so as they celebrated their feasts, they came with something to tell God thank you. And I think we need to borrow something from the Jews. They never came to the Lord empty-handed. They came to say, as much as this is mine, I want to give it back to you and just celebrate your goodness in my life. And as we look at the immediate context of this, uh, this uh, portion of scripture that we've read, uh, Moses is telling the children of, God, uh, of Israel that you are the people of God. And even as you come, when you come, to the place that the Lord has promised you or that the Lord is giving you. I, I, I love the choice of words because he's not saying if, because if means you can either come or you can fail to come. But he says when, meaning that it is a matter of time and you shall come to the place and to the land that the Lord is giving you. So he's saying to them, it is a place of inheritance and you are going to take possession of it and live in it. The Lord has given us his blessings, his promises, and the promises are, of God are as good as done. When he says something, he follows it to perform it and to perfect it in our lives. So he says, when you come to this land, giving the assurance that you will. Verse 2 says, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground. Let me tell you something, that God is a promise keeper. He had told Abraham that I will give you a land that flows with milk and honey. And even though it had taken so many years before Israel realized this promise or, you know, realized or came to inherit the promise of God, God was still on course. The number of years that you have waited upon God are not going to be wasted. We are serving a promise keeper. We are serving a God who is reliable. It can take 430 years like it took for Israel, but he will surely come. 
and he shall uh, fulfill his promise in your life. He said, I will give you a land that flows with milk and honey. This means that God is saying to the Israelites, I will take you to a place of abundance. I will take you to a place that is full of heavenly blessings. And you're going to enjoy the blessings of Canaan. Hallelujah. He is a faithful God. He is a faithful God. And he follows his promise and his word to perform it in our lives. And so this is a time when the land is so productive. What they, they figuratively say, a land flowing with milk and honey, that is milk flow, honey flow you know, in, in the land of promise. And so these people are coming to Canaan. Remember in Deuteronomy chapter 11, he said that the land that you are about to enter into is not like the land of Egypt. It's not like the land where you're coming from. It's not the, like the sufferings that you have experienced in the past. It's not like the place where you have watered with your foot. It is a place that drinks water from heaven. I thought I had a witness. I am telling you when the Lord promises something, he does it. And God has brought us to a place of abundance. In, you may look at your life, investigate your life, and you say, I don't know what she's talking about. But I want to tell you that for as long as you have the promise, the promise is as good as the fulfillment of the promise. Praise the name of the Lord. He told them the place you are about to enter into is a land that drinks water from heaven. And God is offloading us from all the sufferings and all the hustle and all the hard work that we have been putting in to receive a blessing. And he says, when you come to that place of abundance, then you shall take a basket. Hallelujah. I was asking the first church, how big is a basket? You know, looking at the things, in fact, I think on Sunday we can sing the song that says, count your blessings, name them one by one, and see what the Lord has done for us. Amen. So God has done big things in our lives, but he's only asking for a basket. You know, when we count the health, when we count the family that he has given us, when we count the jobs that he has given us, when we count the businesses that he has given us, when we even count our salvation. I was telling the first church, if there is something that is difficult, it is salvation. Do you think it is easy to be born again? There are people who are struggling. I meet people every now and then. Somebody promises, this time around, I am going to be properly saved. I will not go back to the devil. You meet them tomorrow. They are worse than they were yesterday. Because it is difficult. If the Lord does not hold you up in salvation, you cannot brag. There before I never understood why somebody would just refuse salvation. Just something like is as easy as saying yes to the Lord. I did not understand why you have to keep on struggling in sin. You are born again, and therefore you should live smart. Until I discovered it is very difficult. We struggle every now and then, but our struggle has been taken by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that teaches us what to do, how to do it, when to do it. He's the one who holds us. I don't know whether you have found yourself embracing sin. And you know when you're doing it, your mind does not function properly. But the Lord is just right there. And he rebukes you until you feel so useless. Have you ever felt like today I can't go to church? I am so dirty. The Lord is just standing next to us. If we surrender to him and give ourselves in totality to him, we can enjoy salvation. I just want to tell you, you cannot make it in salvation by yourself. If the Lord has sustained you in 2024, and you have not backslidden, you have a reason to tell God thank you. Praise the name of the Lord. If the Lord has not allowed you to go to the ditch. You know, there are times we suffer. The economy, especially this year, has been so difficult. 
You know, there is no money, there is no job, there is no business, there is no this and that. But if the Lord has sustained you in 2024, let me tell you, you will live long. Amen. Not because you are strong, but because the Lord is with you. Amen. And that's the reason we can come to the house of God and say, even if there is sickness, there is this, there is lack, there is no job. Even if I lost my job, at least the Lord has caused me to eat. It is a miracle. Amen? Amen. And I tell you, if you can raise your hand wherever you are, it is a miracle. There is somebody who is not able to do that. And therefore, we are coming with a heart of gratitude. We are telling the Lord, you have brought us to this point. You have brought us to December, January, February, March, April, all the way. The Lord, you have protected us. You have preserved us. We have used roads where many have lost their lives. It is not because your driver was smart. It is because the Lord was right there. He preserved you and he delivered you. You know, you have eaten what other people have eaten and died. But the Lord has preserved you. And therefore, church, we are coming to God and telling him, thank you that you have helped us. We have been helped by the Lord. Hallelujah. And so... Moses is reminding the children of Israel because they are just about to take the land of promise. He's telling them, when you come, then you shall take some of the first of all the fruit and put it in a basket. So the Lord is bringing them to a place of abundance. They, the land is having a lot of produce. They have excess, you know, and they are harvesting. And the, Moses is telling them, take something, the first fruit of every fruit that you receive in this land of promise. Put it in a basket. You know, when I read it, I felt like our God is not a robber. I want to encourage the church, even as you come to offer to the Lord, even as you come to sacrifice to the Lord, he's not asking for 90%. He's just asking for a heart of gratitude. You know, something to show that you are saying, I do not deserve this. I do not own this. The Lord owns me and he owns everything that I have. And therefore, I am taking a small portion and I'm bringing it to the Lord. I'm putting in a basket because a basket is the smallest that there is. But then you put something there to come and honor the Lord with thanksgiving. By the time they are arriving in Canaan, manna stops. It ceases completely. Sometimes I meditate ab about the goodness of the Lord and I stand amazed. By the way, the Lord provides for us from everywhere, every time. When there is no water in the wilderness, we serve such a God who can cause water to flow from a rock. He does not look for a natural resource to provide for you. He makes the resource himself. When you go to a place where there is no food, he is a God who can avail the quails and the manna for that particular season. And I tell you, it will take total dependence on God for you to be supplied. Praise the name of the Lord. I know the Israelites probably kept on looking for manna. They kept on looking for quails. But it was the time to harvest from the abundance that is in the promised land. So you have to walk with God. So they arrived in Canaan and the place had plenty of harvest. And Moses tells them, when you arrive there, make sure you put Something, the first fruit. And remember, it is all the fruit. Sometimes we choose. And sometimes we look at some of the fruits. You know, it's easy to give God, especially for people from my place, to give God mangoes. Especially in this season, they are plenty. Even the gods are really enjoying. But when the Lord gives you another special fruit, there are things that are rare in our land like chapati that people eat once in a year. And so the Lord is asking, even from that flower, get a tenth of that harvest. Put it in a basket, not only mangoes.
put it in a basket and come with a basket and present it to the priest of the day. And many times we, it's very easy to give those other things that are so many and refuse to give God the other things. So he says, take some of the first. He's not asking for everything. He knows that you need to eat chapati, but he's asking some of it. Put it in a basket and carry it in a, in a style of worship and bring it to the place that I have chosen to put my name. I know we give everyone out there in the street, everywhere, but I want to tell you the word of God has never changed. And I usually tell people that the Bible is a closed canon. It is not going to be written again to suit you or what you want to, be, to, to, to do. It is closed. And it says, take that harvest, put in a basket, bring it to the place that I have chosen to put my name and give it to the priest of the day. Thank you so much for giving every other person but the first fruit must come to the house of God and given to the priest of the day, according to the law of God. And then 90%, you can give every other person that you want to give. Praise the Lord. So he says, put it in a basket and come to the place of worship and then declare your testimony. Why we give God is because he first gave us. He gave us salvation. He gave us Jesus. He gave us health. He gave us a job. He gave us a business. He gave us friends. And I know many times we don't think having a friend is a miracle. Wait until you are betrayed or you have somebody like Judas in your company. And then you realize that even having a good friend is a blessing. It has taken the hand of God. And so he says, you declare your testimony. Begin to retell your story. How the Lord has helped you. That is the heart of thanksgiving. It's a heart of worship. Coming with thanksgiving. Telling what the Lord has done for us. And so he says, in verse number three, you shall go to the priest who is in the office declaring today to the Lord, your God, that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to give. Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand. Amen. He shall take the basket. We have said Sunday, this coming Sunday is our thanksgiving. I encourage the church, carry just a basket in your hand. Put some of the, uh, uh, put the first fruit of all the fruits that God has given you in the year 2024. He opened a business for you, take a fruit. He gave you a promotion, take a fruit. He gave you a new job, take a fruit. He married you, take a fruit. He gave you children, take a fruit. Put it in the basket and let's come together on Sunday with a heart of worship. There are no many amens because this sounds like prosperity gospel. It is not. It is a principle in the word of God. And those who have learned the principle, God has blessed them. Even some who are not Christians. They have borrowed a lot of truth from the word of God and they are doing well. They have employed us. I thought it was a wrong place to say amen because we, we, need, we need to be employers as well. But we thank God for them. They have made us put bread on the table. But if we borrow the principle as ourselves, as the Christians, as the body of Christ, we can do marvelous. Praise the Lord. And so when you come carrying your basket, you shall then acknowledge the Lord. That is what... The Bible says, as you shall make response to the priest, you have given your basket to the priest. Verse 5 says, as you make response before the Lord your God, a wandering Aramean was my father. This is referring back to Jacob. You know, the way he ran to, to Syria or Aram, 
and hid there. And that is the place where he got his wives. Of course, we are not talking here about wife. He had two, and he was given two bonuses. And they produced for him the 12 tribes of Israel. I have nothing more to say about that. <laughs> Those are the things you read in scripture, and then you are like, oh, okay. Okay, so then he got the 12, the 12 tribes of Israel. So he's saying you can come and declare or respond to the priest and saying, a wandering Aramean was my father. And he went down into Egypt and sojourned there. Few in number, there he became a mighty nation, great um, and populous. You know, God took 70 people to Egypt, and from there he multiplied them. He made them into a great number. They were wanderers. You know, they didn't have a place. They were slaves in Egypt. And through Moses, God said, I am come to deliver my people. Like God sees our oppression and he delivers us. Remember, this is a testimony. That as you carry your basket, you are coming to say that I was a wanderer. I was in a strange land, but the Lord delivered me. And now I come carrying my basket to offer to the Lord. Verse 6 says that the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us and laid on us hard labor. Then we cried to the Lord. That was the game changer for Israel. You know, even when you're going through the situation that you're going through, because you could be there and saying, I have not seen what you have seen. But I want to tell you, fix your eyes on Jesus and cry to him. That is what the children of Israel did. We cried to him, verse 6, verse 7. We cried to the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice. Our God's eyes are open to our cry. So he says, my father was a Syrian about to perish. He went to Egypt. He was a wanderer. But he went also to Padan Aram. That's why he's saying, I'm an Aramean. Jacob left Egypt when Laban, where Laban was. He went and married in Aram, in Syria. And I tell you, God can bless you from anywhere in this world. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You could be working for that non-believer. But maybe that is Syria for you. And so you carry the, the first fruit from that Syrian and you put in a basket and come with it. Because God is offering deliverance for his people. He, he has actually offered deliverance. If you're finding yourself here, you're blessed of the Lord. Praise the Lord. So they were there and God brought them out of that land of slavery and they came out with a testimony that the Lord is good. This was the heart of worship for the Israelites. Many times when people talk about giving in churches, you know, you know the congregation sometimes loses you because they think you want their money. But we are communicating to you the principles of heaven that can release an, a heavenly blessing to you. Amen. Amen. Giving is not a burden. It is a belief. It is an attitude of thanksgiving. You are giving because God has given you. And I've never seen a poor giver. There's nobody who is a giver and becomes poor. Sometimes we, we even give what we don't have or the only thing that you have. And before the day ends, the Lord just surprises you. The Lord, sub you, you, have you experienced anything like that? You know, God could speak to you. Let me, at this point, just give a small testimony about myself. One time, I woke up, and I was really thinking about my school fees. Mine is not a joke. And that morning when I'm thinking that the money I have to pay my fees is too little, I don't know where to get an extra one to add to that and give. I'm even thinking, where do I borrow? And then the Lord wakes me up at four and tells me to pay fees for some children somewhere. I'm like, 
Sometimes, by the way, for me, at least, I don't understand God in some cases. Because he's supposed to know better what I have, what I'm supposed to pay, and just have mercy on me. And then I woke up, I debated, I prayed. You know, sometimes you even pray against that spirit. But then you find it is the spirit of God. I tell you, I decided to obey him. I took my phone and sent that money to, to, to that school. And that was 4 a.m. when I ha had woken up to pray. At 8, I got an email from school. Uh, and they told me, we have given you a scholarship. Yeah. I imagined. Do you know? It's only that I can't even say what I paid. It's such a shame. What I paid as fees for those children cannot be compared with what was paid for my fees. I just want to encourage the church. If, if you have a heart of giving, and if you hear God telling you, feed the person next to you, do not harden your heart. It is to your own advantage. The Lord has done it for me. And today I'm sustained in school just because of small things that you obey God in. And so these Israelites are being told, you know, being reminded, put something. Do not be hard. Give it to the Lord. And he's going to reward you. I want to encourage you. Be a giver. Be a giver. Give even your clothes. Others will come. Give your shoes. Others will come. Because God is not a debtor of any man. Amen? I will not get into the tithes because of my time. But the Israelites knew how to give. They had three types of tithes. They gave a tithe for the produce. They gave a tithe for the festivals. You know, they gave tithes to the Lord. They gave a tithe to the poor. The three tithes of Israelites. They would go and get something from whatever God has blessed them. And they would bring to the place where God has chosen to put his name. And the poor people amongst them were given. In our church, we have the Levites, and I belong to that category. <laughs> we have the strangers in our church, and we have several. We have several strangers that we are supporting in our church. We have the widows in our church. And we are talking about proper widows who need support because they are widows the Bible doesn't recognize or allow to be put in the category of widows. But we have the real ones that have a description in scripture in our church. We have orphans who do not have parents. They are depending on the church, the people who have been delivered by God to put something and bring here so that the priest of the day can take from the basket and give the widow. Take from the basket and give the stranger. Take from the basket and give those ones who are suffering, the orphans, so that the Bible says they may eat within your towns and be filled. If we have orphans in our church, they need to eat from here. During Christmas, we have set aside a time once in a year to feed those people. Of course, we have a ministry called social ministry that feeds the orphans, the poor throughout the year. But we have this, uh, this season that we have allocated you know, to come, for everyone to come, carrying their basket, putting it there. Let me tell you, if you see how people rejoice as they go for Christmas, the orphans, the widows, the strangers, and the poor in our church, in our church community, if you see the way they rejoice when they get that basket, you will just be willing to give. You change the life of a person. And as they go for Christmas, they know that the Lord has come through for them. And so I encourage you, church, it's a principle. And I'm looking forward to a time that we will see the poor and the widows around our church so that the church can give. If you go to the mosque, 
you will be so surprised. The poor live there. Because they have known how to give. They have borrowed a principle. Because they are also sons of Abraham. They have borrowed the biblical principle. And they are supporting every person that is suffering. The church is welcomed to do that. And so I encourage you to set aside something that you can give to the needy, the poor, and just give them a happy Christmas. And by so doing, my emphasis is not on giving. My emphasis is on thanksgiving and honoring God. Amen? And sharing what you have with a needy person. And what is the significance of this story? You know, because every biblical story has a significance. Everything in the Old Testament is either foreshadowing the New Testament. Actually, the, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So whatever God is saying in the Old Testament is going to get its re, uh, re, revelation then in the New Testament. It's going to be revealed in the New Testament. And so this is a story of a sinner who has been wandering everywhere, has been a slave to sin, has been beaten by the enemy. Pharaoh is an enemy beating the person. But then Jesus has come. I hear Jesus say, I have come so that you may have life and have it in abundance. That is our land flowing with milk and honey. It's a place of abundance. It's a place where you can enjoy life. It's a place of rejoicing. You know, it's a person carrying a basket and saying, I was a sinner. I was a drinker. I was a murderer. You know, the Lord found me and he saved me by grace. And now I am coming to offer to him. That is the significance of this story. You know, we have been strangers far away from the mercy of God. But by grace, by grace, the scripture that was read here by the worship team, you know, Jesus emptied himself. He emptied himself of everything that was in him and gave his life to us. Many times we say, I have given my life to Christ. I learned that recently. And then somebody was preaching and saying, said, you have no life to give to God. Nothing. Totally poor. But Jesus gave his life to you. You are a recipient of life, not a giver. There is no, nothing. You have nothing. Amen? He's a good God. So he sent his son, and his son came to die for us. He found us by grace alone. By grace alone. There is nobody who did so well until the Lord said, if I don't save this one, I'm going to lose. Nobody. In fact, Isaiah, is it Isaiah or Jeremiah who said that our good things were like filthy rags? If you thought you were a good person, it's filthy rags. You better come and get dressed by the Almighty God. And so we are coming to him and saying, Lord, I am the woman who was lost. I am the woman who was homeless. I am the woman who was suffering, but the Lord found me by grace. He came to me and found me dying. The example that we are given in Ezekiel, when that child was born and the mother abandoned the child in the open land and with, with the blood, the, the bath blood around the child, the umbilical cord had not been cut and God saw and went and washed that child and developed that child until she became a beautiful woman. That is what God has done for us. We were left out there, left for the dead, but the Lord spotted us. He came and washed us. He washed us. He cut our cord and disconnected us from the, the curses that we find in two chapters from where we are. Deuteronomy 28. You know the curses? 
the Lord came and cut our cord that was connecting us to those curses. And he has given us the blessing of abundant life. He is a good God. We are no longer cursed. We are no longer strangers. We are no longer homeless. We are cared for. We've been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why we are coming to give thanks to him. The results of our thanksgiving and our giving is that God is going to look down from his holy habitation and he's going to bless us and bless the ground in which we till. If you want to enjoy goodness from the Lord, then you have to have your land blessed. The land produces for us. And therefore, if the Lord looks down from heaven and sends a blessing to that land, we shall come with abundance. We shall see the faithfulness and goodness of the Lord. In conclusion, church, thanksgiving is a spirit is an attitude that honors God. It is that position of saying, I can't do anything without him. Thanksgiving attracts more blessings than what we thought we had. And if you can check from Luke 17, because of time I won't go there, reading from verse number 11 to 19, the story of the lepers, one of them discovered on the way to present himself to the, to the priest, he discovered that he had been healed of his leprosy and he turned back, went to Jesus and gave him thanks. Many times when Jesus blesses us, we think that we deserve it. But I just want to remind the church, turn back. Go back to him and tell him, I am the leper that you healed. I am the sinner that you saved. I am the poor woman that you have made rich. I am the, the person you collected from the wilderness and you have brought me to a happy land. That is the spirit of, uh, of uh, thanksgiving and the attitude of thanksgiving. As we think about the application of this wonderful text that we, we have read, I just want to ask you, what are you thanking God for? What has he done for you? Many times we look for the big things that he has done. But even the small things we can thank him for. There are many who are looking for that small thing that you're calling small. I want you to check your life and ask yourself, what has the Lord done for me? So as we rise up on our feet, I just want everyone to go before the Lord and express your thanksgiving to him. Our God is a good God. He has given us life when we are supposed to die. He has forgiven us of our sins when we were supposed to be judged. He stood in our place and defended us. He is a good God. What are you thanking God for? If there is anybody who has experienced the mercy of God, just lift your voice before him. Lift your hands before him. Remember what he has done for you. Give him thanks. Give him honor. Give him glory because he deserves it. Thank you, Abba Father, for your kindness, your goodness, your mercy. You've been so faithful, so faithful, Lord. We cannot count our blessings, oh God. They are more than can be numbered. You have saved me by grace, my God. You have forgiven me my sin, oh God. You have put me in the right state of mind. You have healed me my diseases, oh God. You have given me a family. You have given me bread. You have given me protection. Lord, I am coming to thank you, oh Father. Thank you, Lord, that you have housed me, O oh God. Thank you because you have given me a voice. You've given me health, O oh God. I'm here to glorify and to honor your name. Receive my thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord Jesus.